Hi there, thank you for joining me for this seventh session of the Medical Assessment of Impairment. My name is Roger Pillema, I'm an orthopaedic surgeon with a particular interest in impairment assessment. At the end of the last session, I asked the following question. If you were given a choice of having either a limitation of 30 degrees of pronation of your forearm or a limitation of 30 degrees of supination and you had to choose one of them, which would you choose? A limitation of 30 degrees of pronation or 30 degrees of supination? Now, if one has a limitation of 30 degrees of supination, there's no way you can apply shaving cream or moisturiser to the opposite cheek. There's no way you can accept change and you can get your hand to your perineum, but you cannot wipe. Loss of supination is therefore a very significant disability. There is no way you can get your hand into a fully supinated position. With only 30 degrees of pronation, however, there is very little impairment because all you have to do to get your hand into a fully pronated position is simply abduct your shoulder. Let me tell you how I became aware of this. While working as a first year surgical intern and while scrubbing for operations, I noted that after four or five minutes my arms became very tired and I had a need to put my arms down to rest. I surreptitiously checked my consultant and the registrar, they didn't seem to have a problem. What I would do then is drop my arms down and make out that I was cleaning my nails, which is required, until I was able to comfortably abduct once more. I simply accepted this as being an individual problem, as I'm questioning none of my colleagues experienced the same symptoms. A few years later I was demonstrating the range of joint movement to students when I noticed that although I had full supination of both forearms, I only had 30 degrees of pronation on each side and the penny dropped. The only way I could get my hands into a fully pronated position in order to scrub was by abducting my shoulders, which in turn caused a feeling of tiredness. So the only limitation I've ever been aware of for my lack of pronation was being unable to scrub continuously for longer than five minutes. So if you're forced to make a choice between limitation of pronation or supination, go for pronation. What I would like to discuss uh, in today's session is scapular winging. Scapular winging due to nerve damage is a fairly uncommon condition and every time I think about it, which is not all that often I must admit, I kind of have to go back to basic principles. So I thought I would try and simplify things. I have used an article on scapular winging published in Musculoskeletal Medicine in 2008 for the basic diagram and much of the information. Now, there are three main types of scapular winging due to nerve damage, the most common being due to weakness or paralysis of serratus anterior, the next most common due to paralysis of trapezius, and the least common and very rare due to involvement of the rhomboids, major and minor. Importantly, all of these muscles tend to hold the scapula against the chest wall, so that damage or denervation of any of them will allow winging to occur, most noticeably with serratus anterior involvement. Here you can see serratus anterior arising from the upper eight ribs and clothing the side wall of the thorax and attaching to the superior angle, vertebral border and inferior angle of the scapula. When serratus anterior contracts, it will pull the scapula laterally. It is therefore easy to visualize that when serratus anterior is paralyzed, the scapula will move medially. Trapezius arises in the midline from the base of the skull all the way down to the lower thorax, attaching to the spinous processes and supraspinous ligaments. The muscle inserts into the spine of the scapula, the medial border of the acromion, and also into the lateral third of the clavicle. Once again, it is easy to visualize that when the trapezius contracts, the scapula will be pulled medially, and when it is paralyzed, the scapula will move laterally. The rhomboids, major and minor, arise from the vertebral spines and intervening spinous ligaments from C7 to T5, deep to the trapezius, and insert into the medial border of the scapula. As with trapezius then, when the rhomboids contract, the scapula will be pulled medially, and when paralyzed, the scapula will once again move laterally. The big differentiation then is that with serratus anterior paralysis, the scapula will move medially, while with trapezius and rhomboid paralysis, the scapula will move laterally. Therefore, with serratus anterior paralysis, one will get medial displacement and winging, whereas with trapezius and rhomboid paralysis, one will get lateral displacement and winging. 
Now for a bit of finesse. Serratus anterior contraction will not only pull the scapula laterally, it will also tend to pull the scapula downwards. Paralysis will therefore allow superior displacement of the scapula. In addition, it will be noted that contraction will rotate the inferior angle of the scapula more laterally, assisting with scapular rotation, and therefore with paralysis, the inferior angle will displace more medially than the superior angle. The arrow then demonstrates the combined effect of serratus paralysis with medial displacement, superior displacement, and medial rotation of the inferior angle. This is well shown here with winging of the scapula, which is displaced medially, superiorly, and with medial rotation of the inferior angle. Here one can see the effects of trapezius paralysis, once again allowing scapular winging to occur with lateral displacement. In addition, with trapezius contraction, the right scapula in the slide will rotate in an anti-clockwise direction, pulling the superior angle of the scapula more medially. Therefore, with paralysis of the trapezius, the superior angle will rotate more laterally. This is a photograph of a case of trapezius paralysis with winging of the scapula, as well as lateral displacement and lateral rotation of the superior angle. With rhomboid paralysis, there will again be lateral displacement. Normally, contraction of the rhomboids will rotate the inferior angle medially and inferiorly, and with paralysis, the inferior angle will rotate more laterally, and there will also be superior displacement of the scapula. It is interesting to note that I was unable to find a picture on the net of rhomboid paralysis, indicating that this is really a rare condition. However, this is a case that I saw who had very severe lacerations of the medial scapular region with the vision of his rhomboids, and one can see the effect with lateral displacement of the scapula, as well as elevation and lateral rotation of the inferior angle. The following slides show the common tests used to highlight winging in each of the three types of palsy noted above. The method suggested for serratus anterior palsy is to get the patient to lean against the wall, taking the full weight on both hands, and then to do a press up against the wall. An alternative method is to get the patient to press the palms firmly together at the level of the lower sternum. The best method for testing trapezius winging is to stand behind the patient who has elbows flexed and to resist external rotation by restraining the patient's forearms. And the suggested method of demonstrating rhomboid winging is to resist extension of the shoulder. This then is a summary of the different types of scapular winging, emphasizing the medial displacement for serratus anterior palsy and the lateral displacement of trapezius and rhomboid palsy and the suggested methods of testing and demonstrating the three types of palsy, and for completeness, the nerve supply of the three muscles. I would suggest that the message of this talk is that whenever one has a case of shoulder discomfort or dysfunction, the patient must always be examined from behind with the shirt or blouse removed. And the final message, as with so many other conditions, is that you do not specifically look for scapular winging, you will never find it. Once again, thank you for your attention and I hope that you will join me for the next session. Until then, Salani Gashle.